Hey, faith family, if that was for me, that's good enough. But can now you honor the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Can you, God, we bless you. God, we honor you. God, we magnify you. We declare there is none like you in all the earth. All hail King Jesus. Man, I am at the Faith Family Church. I, I don't know if you know how good you have it. Sometimes you can be so close to something that you can take it for granted. And you need your brother from another mother all the way down in Merlin to come and let you know this atmosphere of miracles that you're standing in, this church is not normal, this is not average. Most people don't get to walk into an atmosphere like this. This is a blessed house and I'm honored, I'm privileged to be here. And, and, and you've got to understand this, that God determines where he moves. And he only moves in places where he knows that he will get the glory and that his move is gonna be stewarded with wisdom and character. And what God is doing at this church across all of your campuses is because of the phenomenal leadership that God has given you. And Pastor Mike and Pastor Barb, we are grateful. Come on, can you honor your pastors? Some of you might be worried because first of all, you're like, did they bring Chris Rock to preach? I don't know what's about to happen. And then some of y'all are like, what is this kid, 12 years old? I'm not 12, I'm 16, so calm down. But as a young pastor, I'm constantly looking for just models and honestly heroes that me and my wife and our kids can model after. And I've got to let you know, we watch you from afar. We watch your faith. We watch your integrity. We watch your consistency. And I honor you and I'm grateful for the example and the generals that you are in the kingdom of God. Amen. Y'all ready for God's word? Hey, before you sit down, high five three people, tell them buckle up. It's going to be a little bumpy. It's going to... It's gonna be a little bumpy, but we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Hallelujah. Hey, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter four. 2 Kings chapter four, verse eight. Um, as your pastor said, I am a fan of God's team. The Baltimore Ravens. If, if you don't know the Ravens are God's team, that means you do not read your Bible because every time the prophet was hungry, God sent a... You ain't gonna find the Steelers in the Bible, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> hey, before we preach, I just wanna show you why I am more blessed than you are. And I know blessings aren't supposed to be a competition, and it's not a competition, because I've already won. Um, and I am more blessed than you are because my family is better looking than your family. Don't be mad at me, be mad at your mama. It's just, it is what it is. But I think they have a picture of my beautiful family. If they could throw that up, standing next to me is my beautiful wife. Her name is Zai Chandler. I call her my African queen. She hails from Sierra Leone, West Africa. My oldest daughter, her name is Zoe. She is six years old. We call her Zozo, that's her rapper name. And then I have a four-year-old, his name is Roman. His rapper name is Roro. And then I have an 18-month-old. Her name is Jade Mariah. Somebody say Jade Mariah. I need you to remember that name because I need you to pray for Jade Mariah. She is a full-blown heathen. She does not love Jesus. She is the cutest thing on planet Earth. And she uses her cuteness for evil. She knows that she has her father wrapped around her finger. My 18-month old FaceTimed me this morning at 6 a.m. I pick up the phone, I'm expecting to see my wife. My wife is, is my 18 month old. She jumps off the bed, walks into the bathroom, hands my wife the phone, and my wife is like, did you call me? I'm like, no, I thought you called me. She's like, no, I left Jade watching YouTube and she got bored and decided to FaceTime her dad. So she'll probably be a bank robber by the time she's nine. Before I preach, I just wanted, I, I had the privilege of writing a book called Stop Waiting for Permission. And I, I'll put it this way, I wrote this book in about nine months and it took me 15 years to write. You, you know those deals where it comes out fast, but living out the experience is, is a completely different story. And, and, and my goal with this book is to help the body of God, Christ know that God doesn't make average people. 
God doesn't make insignificant people. There's not one per per person in this room, whether you're sitting in the back or on the front, that does not have greatness inside of you. The Bible says that we were made in the image of God. And if we serve a great God, there's greatness in all of us. Now that sounds like a good preach, right? The only thing is based on where you were born, where you came from, the parents that raised you, we all have these different insecurities that we battled it. And growing up, I just thought I was invisible. I thought there was nothing special or unique about me. And as this journey went on, I've seen God do more through my life in 36 years than I thought that he would do in my entire lifetime. And I know that he has the exact same thing for every single one of you. So if you're just in a season where you're just believing God for more, you just feel like, ugh, there's something God wants to do through my life. I'm blessing and believing that this book is gonna impact you. Amen. A pastoral thing to do is to give the book away. Can I, let, let me give it to you right here, gentlemen. What's your, what's your name? Yes, 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 yes. What's your name? Bud. Good to meet you, sir. God bless you. Hallelujah. All the other books are free. Uh, you just have to give a donation of $24. So you can... <laughs> Second Kings chapter 4, verse 8. If you have it, somebody say, yeah. F funny thing about the book, God was really working on me and my wife's heart just about honoring him. And my wife and I said, hey, whatever, if God ever allows us to write a book, we'll give the first back to him. So we made a decision that all the proceeds from the book we're keeping, none of it, all of it is going to the kingdom of God to advance his kingdom. So as you're buying that book, just understand that you are moving the kingdom of God forward. I'll be in the lobby afterward. I'd love to meet you. I'd love to sign it. It'd be a great time. All right, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. If you raise somebody, say, yeah. And it reads, it says this, Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. Somebody say some food. If I had time, I would back up theologically how the Bible proves it was actually jerk, chicken, and peas and rice that the woman of Shunem made Elisha. That's why he came back over and over and over again. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, now look, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in. I gotta pause just for a second so you don't miss this. They built an addition onto their home for the man of God. It's one thing to have a little blow up bed when somebody comes over in your living room, you know what I mean? I grew up in a house where if a family member would come out, we would get kicked out of our room and the family member would sleep in our room and we would have a, a, a camping thing down there. No, they built an addition onto their house for the man of God. And it goes on, it happened one day that he came in there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. In other words, I'm good. I don't need anything. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So he call, said, call her. Then he called her and she stood in the doorway. Then he said, and I need you to say this with me, about this time next year. That's the message today. Come on, say that with me. About this time next year. Come on, can you just prophesy over yourself for a second? Think about March 5th, 2024. What miracle do you want to see in your life? That in this moment, it's impossible. But God said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. She said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your man. In other words, don't get my hopes up. But the woman conceived and bore a son, and when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her, Father God, we're grateful, we're thankful for this moment in your presence. God, you're here because wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you'll be. And God, if you're here, God, healing is here, peace is here, freedom is here. All that we stand in need of is in this room right now. 
So God, I pray that you might increase, that I might decrease, God. God, that your word would go forth. Return with the harvest, 30, 60, and 100 fold. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, somebody shout amen, amen, and amen. Ever since about the age of 15, 16 years old, and I, I, I don't have time to explain it, but that's when I first had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and God completely wrecked my life. But ever since about 15, 16 years old, I have been obsessed with being used by God in a great way. You ever read something in scripture and as if the Bible jumped up and smacked you in the face and said, this verse is for you? I remember at 16, I stumbled across this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, and it says, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And you've got to understand when you've got a second, any, any firstborns, firstborn kids, firstborn kids, yes, 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 also, we hate you, we... Uh, <laughs> On behalf of second through fifth, we can't stand you. You're not our mom, you're not our dad, get out of our faith. <laughs> you can tell God's still healing my heart. I, I adore my older sister, but she, she was just too gifted for my insecurities. She was an out, outspoken a, a extrovert. She was a classical pianist. She got into five different Ivy League schools on the first application. I got into the one school I applied to on the third application. <laughs> Guess which one I went to? That school. <laughs> Universe of Maryland, Fear the Turtles. Anyway, <laughs> and I just had this inferiority complex that there was nothing special or unique about me. And when I found that verse that God knew me, God had a plan and a purpose for me to, to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me hope. It blew my mind. And if I'd be honest with you, it has defined me to this day. But as I read scripture, I noticed something, that God does not move in everybody's life the same way. We all have the same access to God. Somebody say amen. amen. Because of the blood of Jesus on our lives, our past is erased. We have all been a adopted into the family of God as we repent and turn to him for salvation. We all can come boldly before his throne, the Bible says in Hebrews. But as you read scripture, you see God doesn't use everybody to the same degree. God doesn't move in everybody's life the same way. And I'm looking at scripture and I'm saying, God, I see great men and women that you do great things through. And then I see a bunch of average men and women in scripture. And I said, God, how do I get in the category of the people that you do great things? And God, how do I avoid the losers of scripture? <laughs> I mean, everybody knows Abraham, right? You know Abraham? The Bible says that he was the father of faith. Now, it's, it's one thing if you name yourself the father of rock and roll. Like, I mean, you gave yourself that title, whatever. But if God calls you the father of faith, oh, that means something. The Bible says that, that, that God gave him descendants, that he had more children than stars in the sky, that God turned him into a great, everybody knows Abraham. Do you know Lot? <laughs> Lot was Abraham's nephew. Now, the Bible did say that Lot was righteous, and, and we don't hear much about Lot other than he avoided death by the skin of his teeth, and he had a salty wife. Other than that... <laughs> Lot doesn't get much mention in scripture. I'm like, how do I be Abraham and not Lot? Everybody ever heard of David? Come on, everybody knows David who, who defeated Goliath. He killed a lion. He killed, you know, David had his own TikTok song before TikTok was TikTok. It's in scripture. They would sing as David would come back from battle. David has killed his tens of thousands. The king could only kill a thousand. And David's grittying up there. He's like, ah. Every, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Now, you ever heard of Shama? Anybody? Shama? Shama was David's older brother. Same family, same family. Shama has two verses in scripture. The first verse for Samuel 16. God said, Shama? Nope, not him. <laughs> that was his first mention in scripture. God's looking for a king? Shama? Nope, not him. You know the second time Shama was mentioned in scripture? When they were trying to find somebody to kill Goliath, they said, Shama, nope, not him. 
The only time he got mentioned was when God said, find somebody else. He said, God, how do I be a David and not a Shammah? I'm asking God, what do I have to do to be used by you in a great way? And he brings me to 2 Kings chapter 4. And he said, examine this Shunammite woman. The Bible said at the time that Elisha the prophet, he would go from city to city, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, doing what prophets did. And every time he would come to this city of Shunem, this woman would say, hey, you come to the house, let me cook for you. Now, I don't wanna get Pastor Mike and Pastor Barb in trouble, but when you're, you're the pastor of a church, everybody wanna cook for you. Pastor, we made you a meal. Pastor, we, we and you gotta understand, we love you with the love of Christ, but not all you people can cook. Some of y'all need to stick to worship and avoid the kitchen because that, that ain't the call of God on your life. <laughs> so every time Elisha came to shoot him, he's like, no, I'm fasting. No, I'm fasting. No. <laughs> and finally, she convinced him. Now, this ain't biblical, but it's good preaching. The Shunammite woman was from the Caribbean. It ain't Bible, but just take my word for it. And she said, the reason you don't want my cooking is because you've never had jerk chicken and peas and rice. Because if you have it once, you will fill the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Elisha ate once, and he came back over and over and over again. And here's what she said. Cooking a meal for the man of God is not enough. Let's make an addition onto our home so that he can rest every time he's in town. I'll, bear, I'll spare you the story, but back in 2020, during the pandemic, me and my wife literally had nothing to do within the house with these three kids. We're like, we gotta figure out something to do. So our genius self came with the idea of renovating our kitchen in the middle of a pandemic. How do people let me lead a church? <laughs> we started in July of 2020. It finished in March of 21. Not because it was construction the whole time, but because everything was delayed. It was miserable. It was seven months of DoorDash. <laughs> Adding onto your home is not simple. It's not easy. It's not something you do on a weekend. It takes time. It takes effort. And this woman said, I, watch this, here's the whole message. I wanna go out of my way to prepare space for God's presence in my home. The Holy Spirit said, here's the people that I do great things through their lives. That with all the soccer practice, all the in-laws and the outlaws that you've got to keep up with, all the responsibilities at work, all, all that you've got to do, the people that take the time to prepare space for God's presence in their lives. God says, those are the people that I want to do great things through. The Bible says this in Psalms chapter 24, verse three. It says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? And it goes on to say, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. But look what it says in verse six. It says, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. God said there's a generation of people that with all that's going on, they still pursue me and seek me with all their heart. And those are the people that are going to see me move in their lives like never before. Let me say it this way. If you want to see unusual things from God, your pursuit of God must be unusual. If you're the type of person, oh, 90 minutes on a Sunday, you know, a verse a day will keep the devil away. <laughs> you're gonna have an average experience with God. But if you say, God, I'm going out of my way to create space for you in my life, you will see God do what the Bible says, above and beyond all that you could ever ask, think or imagine. Right now in America, we're seeing revival pop up all over the places and universities and youth groups and, and all the, and, and, and here, here's the thought that crossed my mind. This verse talks about a Jacob generation, or the third generation away from the problem. And sometimes we think that revival, that passion for God is reserved for young people. You know, the, the, the teenagers, the students, the youth, or whatever it may be. Here's what I realized as I studied scripture, that yes, the younger generation is what went into the promised land because the older generation doubted God and he left them behind. But Jay, uh, Joshua and Caleb were of the older generation 
but they say, but we've got a young heart of faith. It doesn't matter how old we are physically. We're not going to be left in yesterday's move of God. We want to be smack dab in the middle of whatever God is doing in this day. It does not matter how old you are or how young you are. But if you have a desire, God, whatever you're doing in this time, don't do it without me. You'll see God do great things through your life. I'm going to give you just three quick thoughts. I don't have a long message. About three more hours and we'll be all the way done. But... <laughs> Three quick thoughts of, of how do I prepare space in my life for God? The first thought is this. We've got to learn to prepare with no agenda. We've got to learn to prepare with no agenda. So, so here, here is the Shunammite woman. She, she makes this meal. She puts this addition onto her house and, and she does all of this for the man of God. And look what he says in verse 13. He says, you've gone to all of this trouble. What can I do for you. Is there anything I can say on your behalf, watch this, to the king or to the commander of the army? And she said, I'm content to live at home with my own people. Say what now? First of all, I don't know if y'all missed that. He said, I can go to the president on your behalf or I can go to a five-star general. What do you need me to do? First thing I'm reading this is I need new friends. I don't got no friends that could go to nobody's president or nobody's general. I'm like, the losers I hang out with, I need new friends. The second thing that I'm thinking, by the way, you ever read the Bible and realize you ain't as saved as you thought you were? You read some of these men and women of God in the Bible, you're like, I got some work to do. If a man or woman of God said, what can I do? Name it. Y'all, I'm coming out like a Santa Claus. Okay, here. Uh, here's what I need done. I need that car. I need that house. God, remember that enemy? If you could kill him, that'd be great. I, I mean, I've got a list of stuff that I want God to do for. And then I'll, I'll throw something spiritual. God, save a couple people. God, give us a building. I mean, I'll, I'll make sure it sounds, you know, pastoral. But I've, don't look at me like that. You got some stuff in your life that you want God to do. This woman said no. I wasn't making space for God out of manipulation. I wasn't seeking God for what he could do for me. I, I put this addition on my house to honor what God was doing, not to get something. And I was convicted. And hear me, God says, make your request be known before God. He said, cast all your cares upon him. There is nothing wrong with requesting of God, asking of God, believe. My goodness, we're at faith family. You must be living by faith. Somebody say amen. amen. But there's gotta be a part of our pursuit of God that I'm going after you just because you're good and just because you're awesome and just because you're holy and just because you're the creator at heaven and earth. And if you don't do anything else for me, you've already done enough. God, it is you that I see. We've got to learn to prepare space for God without a preconceived agenda. God, I'm not doing this for you to do something for me. God, I'm doing this because you are good. At our church, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting at the beginning of every year. And, and it, is, it, it, it is one of the greatest factors to what God is doing at our church. I tell you, every time we do it, the way that God moves and heals and speaks, it blows my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm saying all of that because I'm about to tell you how much I hate fasting. <laughs> I cannot stand fasting. I know y'all like, you skinny, you, you, you don't even really care about food, hear me. In this skinny boy's body, there's a big boy on the inside of here that loves to eat. And so for me, every time we do a fast at our church, you know, some of y'all, y'all so mature and stuff. Y'all, y'all like, I'm gonna I'm a drink broth for three days before the fast. I'm gonna I'm a taper, I'm gonna prepare. No, not me. I prepare for a fast like a bear prepares for winter. Eat everything you possibly can, and maybe you won't be hungry as you go through. Can I get an amen? It's gotten so bad that I'll cook my favorite meal, whatever it is that year, before the fast. So this year, I made gumbo, y'all. I made Baltimore gumbo. Not no New Orleans gumbo, not no Louisiana gumbo, Baltimore gumbo. And if you're not from Baltimore, you may think it has a T. It's not Baltimore, it's Baltimore. There's a difference. <laughs> Went to the store, got me all the blue crab and shrimp and crawfish. And, yo, my gumbo was so bad, I made the roux myself. I'm not talking about no Amazon Prime porter. No, 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 no. I'm talking about made my own shrimp broth. Your boy was 
bad. I didn't realize how long it took to make a stupid bowl of gumbo. By the time I got back from the supermarket, I was exhausted. I said, I'll do this tomorrow. Next day, I woke up, I cut up all the vegetables, I, I, I deshelled all the shrimp. That took me two hours. By the time I was finished prepping, I'm like, I'm tired. Put all in the fridge. It wasn't until the third day that I threw it all in a pot. My wife was like, it's going to spoil if you don't cook it. I started making the roux at 6 p.m. How many people know that's stressful? Sitting there stirring for an hour and a half straight. Dinner wasn't done till 11.30 at night. Now, by the way, my gumbo was bad. It took me three days to make this one pot of food. What am I trying to say? Preparation isn't easy. Preparation isn't convenient. Preparation isn't something you can do on the, that's why most people don't prepare space for God. Because it takes time. It takes rearranging your calendar. It says, it takes take, telling, saying no to certain opportunities or certain things that you've been hoping for. It, it, it takes particular ingredients to prepare space for, can I give you three ingredients to prepare space for God? The first thing is I need to apply his principles. Any area of your life that you want to see a miracle from God, you've got to apply his principles. Can I give you some principles from God's word? He said, if you want to be trusted with much, then be faithful with little. Don't expect God to move in an area of your life where you're not being faithful with the little that you have because he won't trust you with much. The Bible says that we serve a God of excellent. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. Excellence is an invitation to the presence of God. Can I get up in your business? So if your trunk is dirty and your garage is cluttered, don't expect God to bless you with more because you're not being excellent. Oh, uh oh, y'all don't like this. That's all right. It's Baltimore Ravens preaching to y'all. If you show up to work 15 minutes late, take an hour and 20 minute lunch break, don't expect God's favor at work because I've got to apply his principles before I can see his miracle. It ain't fun, but somebody say amen in this place. I've got to apply God's purpose. If I had time to, to tell you, that America is trying to redefine everything that God has already defined. You're going to be open-minded. No, I'm not going to be no open-minded for you to nub all type of foolishness in my mind. I'm closed-minded to the word of God. And God has had purpose for every single area. And I've, I've got to know, God, what is your purpose for this? If I'm going to see let me give an example. God has a purpose for Stephen's marriage. Stephen has a purpose for his marriage. My wife ain't here, so I can tell you my purpose for my marriage. My purpose for my marriage is to make me happy. That's what I want. I want to be happy. It's not God's purpose. For, God wants me happy, but that's not his primary goal. His primary goal is that the way that I love my wife shows her the love of God. The way that I love my wife is an example to the world of God's love for his church. And whenever I make my purpose supersedes God's purpose, I won't see his miracles in my life. Principles, purpose, the power of God. I've got to recognize that God's power is on my life. That I'm not just some average person walking around. I'm not just somebody trying to make it in this rat race called life. I am the anointed of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside. These are ingredients for a move of God in your life. Second thought is this. Write this down. Write this down. I've got to prepare for the supernatural. I've got to prepare for this super. This woman's response to the prophet's request is mind blowing. What can I do for you? Nothing, I'm good. That's crazy. And I've got some more growing in Christ to do because that would not be my response. The prophet's response to her, I don't need anything, is even crazier. Look what he said. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of context, but evidently she did not have a son. We don't know if she didn't have any children at all, but we know she didn't have a son. 
We also know that based on them mentioning how old her husband was, it was probably past the age where having children was an expectation. This man of God looked at her and he said, I know the deepest desires of your heart and because you've created space for God with no agenda, he's gonna give you your greatest desire. Now, when he asked her, what can I do for you? And she said nothing. That makes me think one of two things. Either A, she really didn't want anything from God or B, she thought that this request was too big for God. Or maybe she thought she wasn't saved enough to see God do something like that through her life. You would not believe how many people, can I, I'm going home, so I'm gonna get up in your business, that are sitting in this room right now or watching online, that even though God has forgiven your past, you still think about it. And there's something in your past that makes you think you are disqualified from the fullness of God being released in your life. And because of that, there's something that you hold dear, but you're not bringing it up by faith to God because you're like, if I bring this up and he doesn't do it, I don't know if I can handle the disappointment. You've got to understand that you are the apple of your father's eye. He said, if I did not withhold my own son, Jesus Christ, how much will I not freely, freely give you all things? Can I be a little bold for a second? How dare you say that your God is the creator of the universe and you not have great expectations of him? I know we don't know each other even though we family. You're like, oh, is this kid getting up in my face? And I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching to myself because sometimes I come into the presence of God and, and I don't have any expectations. I'm not believing. God is saying, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I can do? There is no addiction that is too strong that the Holy Spirit that can't break. There is no problem in a marriage that God cannot restore. There is no sickness he can't heal. There is no business he can't expand. There is no relationship that he can't restore. There is no mental health crisis that he can't bring peace that surpasses all understanding. There is nothing our God cannot do. Here, here, here's what I've discovered. If I treat God like a genie and I just throw up a quick offering and a worship and expect it, he ain't, he ain't gonna do nothing for me. But if my greatest pursuit is the heart of God and not the hand of God, he said, there's nothing I won't do for you. The Bible says this in Psalm 37 verse four, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Faith family, this may sound presumptuous, but I'm here today to say, let's, let's take our faith to another level. Let's get to a place where we're expecting God to do something in our lives that we can't do for ourselves. We're expecting him to throw open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that's too big for us by ourselves, that impacts our kids and our coworkers and our neighbors and shows this world the glory of God. Last thing is this, write this down. It is well when you've prepared. All right, I got good news and I've got bad news. I'm not gonna ask you which one you want because people always say, I want the bad news. Why, well, you masochist, calm down. So I'm gonna give you the good news first. The good news is there is a miracle with your name on it. We serve a God that does above and beyond all that you can ever ask, think, or imagine. I don't care if you just got saved last Sunday or you about to get saved eight minutes from now. Before you even honored God, he knew you and called you and fashioned you and formed you and had a plan and a purpose for your life. You are the called of God. Somebody say amen. You ready for the bad news? There's no miracle without drama. There's no move of God without opposition from the enemy. There's no fulfillment of a promise without pain. 
He said, about this time next year, you're gonna embrace a son. That time next year, she gave birth to a son and that young boy grew over a number of years. And years after the miracle, the Bible says that the boy was out in the field with his dad. And, and I hate this part of the Bible because it makes his dad look really bad. <laughs> but he goes to his dad and he said, dad, I have a headache. And that boy, his dad said, go tell your mama. <laughs> That's not us type of dads. That's that, his dad was here. Anyway. The boy goes to his mom and said, Mommy, I have a headache. And a few hours later, the boy was dead. We all want to shout and scream about the miracle that God's going to do for us. What you don't hear a lot of preaching about is what do I do when my miracle is dead in my hands? What do I do when that miracle business that God gave me is now on the verge of closing? What do I do when this marriage that was a miracle from God now seems like a thorn from Satan? What, what do I do when this health that God restored is now failing me? What do I do when, when the miracle that I was believing God for seems like it's on life support? The Bible says this, verse 21, and says she took that young boy's lifeless body, she went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God. She shut the door upon him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, watch this. It is well. Y'all, if I'm holding my baby's lifeless body in my hands, I don't know if I could choke out of it is well. What faith. Watch this. Because she had spent a lifetime preparing space in her life for the presence of God, when tragedy hit, she knew exactly where to go. She took that lifeless situation to the space that she had been preparing her entire life and laid his body in the pro She said, I know where to go. I don't know if you caught this. Do you remember maybe, what was it, week 10 or 12 of the NFL season where that young man dropped dead on the field? And next thing you know, a prayer movement broke out all over the NFL. You see people praying in the middle of the field. Why? Because we don't know what to do when life outside of I've got to go to the presence of God. Here's the problem. If I haven't spent time preparing space for God, when life hits, I've got nowhere to go. But if I've been consistent and disciplined in spending time with God and creating space for God when that diagnosis comes, when, when, when that supper, whatever it is, I know where to take it. I take it into the presence of God. There's so many marital arguments in the Bible, it's hilarious. She goes to her husband and said, I got to go to the prophet. And this man had the nerve to say, oh, this ain't prophet season. I don't know how it worked back then, but apparently there were times when the prophet had office hours, like a professor or something like that. <laughs> and she said, this isn't the time you get to go to the prophet. Now, if you're not Caribbean, you won't understand this, but if you are, you, this is a full sentence that she responded to her husband. It's a full sentence. What it means is, get out my face. <laughs> she said, it is well. Here's what she meant by that. She said, yeah, this ain't the time that the prophet is meeting, watch this, normal people. This ain't the time that the prophet is entertaining normal guests, but I ain't normal. I'm the woman that's prepared space in my home. I'm the woman that's fed him over and over and over again. I'm the woman that did not let God's presence drop from being the top priority in my life. So for normal people, they don't have access. For normal people, it's not their season. For normal people, they've got to wait in line. But I'm not normal. I'm somebody that has prioritized God's presence. And faith family, I need you to understand, when you make room for God, the rules that apply to this world 
do not apply to you. The economy that applies to this world do not apply to you. The diagnosis that apply to this world do not apply to you. We have an access to God that not everybody has because we've made room for Him in our lives. Look at somebody next to you, tell them you're not normal. Stay standing, I'ma read one verse, I'ma pray, I'm done. Some of us are watching CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and we're getting all freaked out because we think what's going on there applies to us because we've forgotten that we are the redeemed of the Lord. We are the righteous of the Lord. We are the called out ones. We are the ones that have access to the presence of God. Those rules don't apply to us. The Bible says this in Psalm chapter 27, verse one, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they will stumble and fall. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though a war may rise up against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have have desired for the Lord and that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever that I may dwell in the house all the days of my life behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle I shall hide I shall set me high upon a rock and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Faith family, we are in the house of God. We are in the presence of God. And because he is for us, it does not matter what's against us. Come on, can you bless God? Can you honor him? Come on, let's.